Good morning. Well, not good morning. Good afternoon now, I guess. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to this Cato Institute event, uh, Economic Inequality. Are we measuring it right and what does it mean? Uh, my name's Ryan Bourne. I'll be moderating today's uh, proceedings. I'm an economist at the Cato Institute. Um, back in 2014, the Pope tweeted, inequality is the root of social evil. Former President Barack Obama has described inequality as the defining challenge of our time. Bernie Sanders today says uh, US levels of inequality show that the system is rigged to benefit the billionaire class. These are just a taste of things regularly said about economic inequality. Now, one of two assumptions logically underpins these views, either that the current distribution of income or wealth is unjust, or that that current dispersion will bring negative economic or social consequences in the future. And this idea that more inequality is bad and less inequality good underpins much public debate. It's become the moral foundation for calls for more government redistribution of income and wealth and high taxes on the rich in particular. But a given distribution doesn't fall manna from heaven, nor is it predetermined solely by government. It reflects millions of interactions, trades, decisions, inheritances and policies um, which are undertaken every single day. A Gini coefficient or a statistic of the income or wealth share of the top 1 or 10 percent is aggregate snapshot information. It does not tell us how individuals' relative positions change over time, nor does it tell us how that distribution has arisen. Crucially, measures of distribution do little alone to tell us about the absolute living standards faced by those at different levels of income. Now, that's important because high levels of inequality can indeed theoretically reflect injustices. They can arise from government capture by special interest groups, uh, cronyism and corruption, poor education, family breakdown, racial discrimination, long-term unemployment and social immobility might all lead to income or wealth inequality widening. On the other hand, inequality might reflect beneficial activities such as technological advances, entrepreneurialism and free trade. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs got incredibly rich by providing services that enriched our lives. In South Africa, income inequality rose after apartheid ended as talented black people had opportunities open to them for the first time. Chinese inequality has risen dramatically since 1980 as the country as a whole has got richer. British inequality fell after a catastrophic financial crash in 2008 which saw rich people lose more relatively than poorer people. In China, greater inequality was a symptom of success. In Britain, greater equality was a symptom of a problem. Walter Schiedel's book, The Great Leveler, shows that the largest reductions in economic inequality through history have only been achieved through pandemics, mass mobilization war, violent revolution, or state failure. The Soviet Union, after the nationalization of banks, redistribution of land, the gulags et al, had very low uh, economic inequality. Um, it should seem obvious that the price of lower inequality in, in that case uh, was intoler intolerably high. At best then, inequality serves as an indicator of potential underlying economic problems. At worst, worry about it distorts us from priorities that might matter more, such as the living standards of the least well off. That's why in public discussions and when considering policy, it's crucially important that we measure inequality accurately and put it into its correct context to reflect the true uh, well-being of different groups and especially the poor. Otherwise, we create false narratives which lead to highly damaging policy being implemented. So to talk about the measurement of uh, economic inequality and its policy implications, we're delighted to be joined by two great speakers today. John Early has twice been Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Labour Statistics, where he became an expert on measurement issues relating to income inequality. He is founder and president of Vital Few LLC, an international consultancy specialising in the application of mathematical economics. Perhaps most importantly for this event, he is the author of the Cato Policy Analysis, Reassessing the Facts About Inequality, Poverty and Redistribution which drew praise from a wide variety of sources for, for um, uh, resetting the debate about economic inequality. 
And as a result of that, and off the back of that, he's penned a number of very important op-eds uh, with former Senator Phil Graham on the pages of the Wall Street Journal. Chris Edwards is Director of Tax Policy Studies at the Cato Institute and editor of Cato's downsizinggovernment.org website and is the author of a forthcoming paper on wealth inequality and wealth taxation that should be with us in a number of months. So John will speak for around 20 minutes or so, 20 to 25 minutes, Chris for, for 8 to 10 minutes, and then we'll have a moderated Q&A um, at the end. So thank you again for coming, and I hope you enjoy this, what I hope will be a very, very informative event. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for that uh, introductory remark that kind of set the context for why the question of income and uh, wealth and unemployment I mean, and uh, poverty related to inequality is so important from a policy perspective. So I'm going to focus specifically on the question of are, are we measuring it well? And if so, if not, what are the issues? I'm going to evaluate income inequality and poverty data specifically, and assess both the current levels and the trends of those data, what, look at what the official measures actually miss, and then look at what more comprehensive measures tell us about the status of income inequality in the United States. Now, um, you have a number of papers that have been handed out. Some of the numbers I'm going to be presenting today will not necessarily track 100% with those, although the con the Final conclusions are much the same, but I've been updating the data with new, new information as it goes along and it's now, now more current. Uh, I'll also be going rather quickly to hit the high points so that you'll have time at the end to pursue those particular details that are of interest to you. The Census Bureau conducts the current population survey and from that the money survey or the money income data is created from that survey. And that is really the foundation of most of the American measures of income inequality. Now, there are some exceptions to that, but most of them derive at least in part from this source. And there are four main buckets of income in the, that measure. One is earned income, which is both uh, employment, earned employment income and uh, investment and savings income. Uh, a small amount of private transfers, such as child support and alimony. Uh, social insurance transfers, which is composed of uh, Social Security, unemployment insurance, and uh, worker comp. And finally, other government transfers, which uh, tend to be uh, need-based in some sense. Uh, the public assistance piece, which is temporary assistance for needy families, plus corresponding state programs, supplementary security income, and education in terms of uh, assistance in terms of grants. Uh, no other uh, transfer payments are included in this measure. Now, this chart here, and we're going to be looking at three others like them from, uh, as we add more data to it. This is the basic census money income measure. And along the, the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, we have the five quintiles of, of income, household income. A quintile has one-fifth of the population in it. And so uh, one-fifth of the household in the bottom, one-fifth in the top, and each of the ones in between. And the uh, light green vertical axis, I mean, a vertical bar there is, is the earned income, and it, of course, in all but th uh, one of these cases, constitutes the vast majority of the income in the, uh, in the quintile. Um, you will notice that at the top of the uh, upper income uh, bar, there's a little 2%. Well, that says that in addition to the earned income, there are 2% of transfer payments going into the upper income, and that's basically Social Security for people in the upper incomes who retire and draw their Social Security. And that number is relatively small as you uh, go down the, uh, uh, the quintiles, but when you reach the bottom quintile, uh, you will notice that transfer payments, in this case mostly Social Insurance, Social Security, account for over 600 percent of what they earn. So in other words, it's about 90% of their total income is, is associated uh, with uh, government transfer payments. Now, this all then means 
that top to bottom is a ratio of 13. The little over $200,000 to the about $29,000 uh, at the lower end is a ratio of 1 to 13. So that's, that's, a, that's one kind of measure of inequality. The top quintile gets 13 times as much on average as the bottom quintile. But this picture is not complete. There's a lot of missing information from this measure. The biggest is one and a half trillion, with a T, dollars in transfer payments from government to lower income people. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, food stamps are the big pieces, but also refundable ta refunded tax credits like the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, nutrition, rent subsidies, and a bunch of others about, about amounting to more than $300 billion. There's also significant underreporting um, uh, for the, t for the uh, transfers that are actually included. So for the transfers that are reported by census, they are short by $139 billion from the amount that was actually dispersed to those programs. So we, we have programs that aren't counted, we have programs that are undercounted. We're also missing em employer paid taxes for social insurance. Uh, we're missing the employer contributions to health insurance, so there's a lot of income there that's missing. Uh, at the high end of income, uh, capital gains are not included and uh, some other unreported income. At the low end, second jobs and sporadic jobs tend to be underreported in the surveys, but we pick them up in looking at uh, tax data. One of the big missing pieces is that 60% of earned income uh, for retirement is missing. Uh, that would be your 401ks, your IRAs, and so on. And of course, the effect of taxes is missing as well. So fortunately, the Congressional Budget Office has done a good job of correcting about two-thirds of this uh, problem and have filled it in, and we get the following result. Now, let's look at the upper income, the top uh, bracket there, and see some differences. The first thing you'll notice is that it's maybe the least obvious because the scale had to change here, but the amount of income for the, that is earned by the upper bracket actually raise, rises from just a little over 200,000 to just a little over 300,000. So the uh, missing income that gets filled in there makes that bigger. But the next big thing to notice, of course, is we're taking taxes out, but in this case, specifically federal taxes. So then the net result is that the pay that's available, the disposable income to the upper income uh, quintile is 26% reduction on what they earn. In other words, the net effect of taxes, reduction by taxes and adding the small amount of uh, transfer payments means that they pay out and they only have 26% of what they earned available. The fourth quintile, similar, but a, a, lot, a lot smaller in the numbers, obviously. At the fifth quintile, or, or I'm sorry, the third quintile in the middle, we get uh, their the transfers on the one hand and the taxes on the other but largely balance each other out. And then if you look at the bottom quintile, you'll notice that that little purple box, that's the uh, one and a half trillion dollars of missing uh, uh, transfers. A bit of that is also in the second quintile, but most of it is there. So that income in the uh, bottom quintile, based on the CBO numbers, is about 1,200 percent or 13 times bigger than the amount of income earned there is government transfers in. This reduces now, despite the larger increase in the income of the upper, upper end that was missed in the uh, census estimates, at the lower end, we added a lot of income that was missed as well because, by the left out transfer payments. So the ratio is now not 13 to 1, but 6 to 1. But that still hasn't taken care of all the problem. State and local taxes are not, have not been included. There's another $300 billion in transfer payments. And there are also what are called extreme poverty cases. These are people, or these are households that have between, have less than $4 per day per person in the household, or less than $2 per day per person. And a fellow by the name of, uh, of uh, Myers at uh, University of Chicago has done a great job of sorting that out, and it turns out that 64% of these are not even poor at all. 
Now, they're not wealthy, but their incomes are misreported. So if we correct for all of those things, the distribution looks like this. Uh, the taxes get a lot bigger because of the state and local taxes being included. Uh, you'll notice that the percent rise in uh, attributable to transfer payments for the bottom quintile is now a little bit smaller. Instead of 1,100 percent, it's 800 percent. But that's because we've added income in on the earned income level. Uh, you, maybe a little hard to see. Uh, these charts are a little bit small at this distance. But uh, we've uh, nearly doubled the earned income level so that the, uh, the effect of uh, the transfer payments is relatively smaller. So if we fill those gaps, the ratio now becomes 4 to 1. So now we have reduced the inequality by about a factor of three simply just by counting all the money. We don't count all the money in the official, state, official data. Now, another way of looking at these same data is to put them in this form here. And uh, you, if you notice the dotted line, it's the, bottom, it's the lower line on the um, left-hand side and it's the upper line on the right-hand side. That is the private income, and it's basically the earned income plus the small amount of private transfers. And that shows a great variation from just a few thousand dollars to uh, about $300,000, as we saw. Now, what happens is, at the upper end, the red, the red section there, the red checkers, that's the taxes that are taken away. And this is net taxes. It's taxes, but it's also offset with any transfers that are, that are paid into there. And so for the first two quintiles, large proportions of the income are taken away with taxes. Then at the middle income, as you see, they largely uh, are offsetting to each other at the middle. It's at about the 54th percentile, for those of you who observe that sort of thing. Then from there on, you now have a green area, which is the transfers being transferred in. The red area is about $3.5 trillion of taxes. The green area is about $2.5 trillion of transfers. The other trillion dollars goes to pay for uh, government services and so on. So what's then interesting is that the resulting net income that people get to sit, keep for the first four quintiles is very, very flat. It doesn't even double from beginning to end. Now, of course, the uh, top quintile still has something more of a rise. But again, as we saw, that's only 4 to 1. So we went from 13 to 1 to 4 to 1. And we put the first four quintiles such that they're not even two to one different from each other. OK. Now, Ryan mentioned the Gini coefficient. And you can't talk about inequality without mentioning it, because people talk about it. Now, it's not a very good measure. I'm not endorsing it. I, in fact, I don't like it at all. Uh, but it, we have to talk about it, because people talk about it. And also, it gives us a great chance for a bad pun. A fellow named Gini invented it, G-I-N-I. And so I like to say he's let the, uh, the genie out of the bottle. Now, the genie coefficient ranges between 0 and 1. It can't be any, anything else outside that range. At 0, it means there is no inequality. Everybody gets exactly the same. All the households get $60,000 a year. At 1, it actually can't ever quite reach 1. That's why I have that little limit sign down there for those of you who are mathematicians. But it, it approaches one once you get one family having everything. One family has $25 trillion, and none of the others have anything. And so um, we can say approximately a Gini coefficient, say, of 0.3, would say that we would have to redistribute about 30% of all income in order to reach total equality. Now, this Gini index has done a good deal of, of uh, confusion in life because OECD publishes the Gini index for several nations. And uh, this chart here, all the blue lines there, or, or blue bars, are the OECD publication of data uh, submitted to it by the participating countries of the Gini coefficient for income distribution in those countries. And sure enough, as, uh, as has been often cited in the press, the United States is somewhat higher than the others. Not radically higher, it just happens to be the top of the, of the seven that are shown there. These are the major uh, advanced countries. You know, we're not dealing with small countries or countries that are not yet developed. But just like we were missing about one and a half trillion dollars in the census data, 
Well, the same one and a half trillion dollars, or at least most of it, is also missing from this data. When census submitted it, they didn't include it. If you add it in, you wind up in the red bar. Where does the red bar? Right in the middle, right between Japan and Canada. So the United States is essentially the same level of inequality as those other countries. This trend chart over the last 40 years shows essentially the same thing. The heavy blue line at the top is the OECD publication. The heavy red line in the middle is the US corrected for those, uh, for those uh, problems that we already identified. And what do we see? For every country in here, except France, all rose by a small amount over the last 40 years. The US rose by about the same amount and in the same range. So not much different from the other industrial countries. Now we're going to turn to take a look at poverty. There's two sets of data we need to work with with poverty. <coughs> One is the poverty threshold. Those are the indicators of what it takes to be poor. There are 48 of these for different sizes and compositions of families. And each of these thresholds is set, has been set by the cost of a, what's called an economy diet uh, in 1963. Uh, th those diet figures, costs came from the Ag Ag Department of Agriculture and Bureau of Labor Statistics. Then that number is multiplied by three because the Consumer Expenditure Survey in 1958 said that the average family spends three times its food budget on all expenditures. And then that number has been escalated by the change in the consumer price index every year since then. Well, we've already figured out that the, inco the income data isn't so good. But in any case, census takes that income data, which is missing a lot, of a lot of transfer payments, compares it to the threshold. And if it's less than the threshold, that family is counted as poor. But we know better. We know that we need to add in one and a half trillion dollars of, of uh, transfer payments plus some other uh, income items. And if we do that, look at this chart here. The horizontal axis here is the lowest 20th percentiles of income. Okay. In other words, it's the, it's the lowest quintile broken up into 1% increments. And so that, that shows what the Census Bureau uses to compare to the standard. The standard is then the dashed line going across, across there. And sure enough, they intersect at 12.3%, the official poverty rate for, 19, I mean for 2017, the last year for which it is available. However, if we count the missing income, it's only 4.3%. So it's cut by more than a factor of three. Now, the other piece of the poverty calculation looks at the thresholds. And the big concern here is the use of the CPI to escalate that, to increase it. There are a number of different kinds of biases listed here that we can talk about in the question period if you want to talk about them. But basically what it means is that over from 1963 to 2017, the CPI used to escalate the poverty uh, thresholds rose by 701%. Of that, only 365% was pure price increase. The remainder was an improvement in the standard of living that was being called poor. So if we correct that and create new standards, new, in, uh, new um, uh, thresholds that are not biased by the CPI, we get a, a table that looks like this. Now we have a new unbiased set of, of uh, thresholds, the purple dotted line at the bottom. And if we combine that with the improved income measures that counts everything, we now have a poverty rate of 2.2%, a reduction of more than a factor of five. Now, we can look at this historically as well. And this actually tells a fairly interesting uh, historical story. The blue line there is the official poverty rate. And you'll notice that from uh, the late 1940s, up until uh, Lyndon Johnson announced the war on poverty in 1964, that it had already declined from 35% down to less than 20%. So it was already on a decline. And if it had followed it, that dashed line, that black dashed line there, is the trend it was already following. And so it didn't really change a whole lot when the war on poverty came along. And in fact, it flattened out. 
And after hitting a, uh, a low of 11.1% in uh, 1973, it has never gotten that low again. It goes up and down with recessions and recoveries, but it just hasn't changed, despite the fact that we're spending trillions and trillions of more dollars. However, at least part of that is a measurement problem. The brown line, the bottom line there, corrects for counting all the, all the income and corrects for the biases in the consumer price index and gets us down to, it continues to decline more slowly, but it's continued to decline even to this day. And we now are at 2.2% of uh, poverty. The summary points to take away from this is transfer payments and taxes are tools used by government to take away money from the top quintiles and give it to the bottom quintiles. And in doing that, they eliminate 93% of the earned income inequality. Income inequality is not greater than in other countries, and the trend is not different from other countries. And the official data on income inequality overstates it by a factor of three or more. The official uh, measures of poverty overstate it by a factor of five or more. Now let me emphasize, this isn't the, the people running these surveys and doing these calculations are making a mistake. They're adhering to the established definitions that some combinations of the operatives in the Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and at OMB have decreed as to how these indexes were to be calculated. We could change that tomorrow and calculate them differently. So this isn't a matter of, def of, of mistake, it's a matter of definition. And these changes make a big difference in the facts on which we're going to make our decisions about policy with respect to income inequality. The facts are very different than what we presume them to be. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John, and thanks a lot, uh, Ryan. So John talked about income inequality, and I'm going to talk about uh, wealth inequality. Uh, but first, I want to build on one of John's themes, uh, and that is don't just accept income and wealth data uh, that you see. Always be skeptical, whether it's government data or private data. Uh, there are many ways to put income and wealth data together, and economists often make different assumptions, and you can get some very different results. Um, John showed you that. Um, the official poverty rate is 12%, uh, but if you add in additional transfers that the government leaves out, the poverty rate drops to 2%, which is a pretty, pretty <coughs> radical difference. Uh, I'm going to go through just a couple charts uh, showing you, giving you some other examples uh, of that. So this table is from a, uh, a study by the Urban Institute, Stephen Rose, um, just a few months ago. He looked at six different scholarly stu studies uh, showing the change in uh, real median income in the United States between 1979 and 2014. Uh, there are dramatic differences in these studies. Uh, one study by the French economist Thomas Piketty showed that uh, U.S. real uh, median income has actually dropped over the last few decades by 8%. But on the far other end of the spectrum, the CBO came out with a report last year showing that median income has risen 51% over the last few decades. That is a pretty dramatic difference. Uh, data is very powerful. Uh, unfortunately, pessimistic data often drives the public narrative. So there was a, a Joe Stiglitz uh, op-ed in the New York Times a few days ago. Stiglitz is a, a Nobel Prize winning economist. <clears throat> he starts off his column and he frames it around the statement. He says, quote, some 90% have seen their income stagnate or decline in the past 30 years, unquote. Stiglitz didn't attribute where he got his data from, but he's clearly taking the most pessimistic view of what has gone on to middle class income in the United States. The CBO came out with a report just a few months ago uh, showing completely different results than, uh, than Dr. Stiglitz shows. So here's another uh, really interesting example of that. Uh, this chart shows you the top 1% uh, income uh, share uh, in the United States. In other words, the top uh, one percent of earners, what share of all uh, U.S. national income they earn. So the line at the top is uh, uh, also by Thomas Piketty uh, and, his, uh, and his colleagues. 
Uh, uh, this data has got a lot of uh, coverage in the media over the years. It shows that the top 1% have a sharply rising share uh, of U.S. income from around 10% uh, up over 16% uh, or so. Uh, so this, of course, has driven a lot of the narrative we hear about uh, the, the rich getting richer and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a very good study that came out last year by uh, Jerry Otten of the U.S. Treasury and David Splinter of the Joint Tax Committee. They went back and they looked at uh, the Piketty uh, data. So Piketty's start, starting point is U.S. income tax returns. Uh, and he makes all kinds of assumptions to expand the income tax data up to national income. Tax returns capture about 60% of national income. So Watton and Splinter start from the same point, U.S. tax returns, they also extrapolate up to national income, but they make all kinds of different assumptions, dozens and dozens of them. It's a really a, a fascinating uh, paper. They come out with completely different results. So as you can see, Otten and Splinter find, uh, this is in after tax, uh, with after tax uh, income levels here, the top 1% share has essentially been flat for five decades now, which is remarkable. I mean, if their data is right, it completely undercuts a lot of the narrative we hear about uh, high earners doing very well and everyone else uh, not doing very well uh, at all. So let's switch over to uh, talk a little bit about uh, wealth inequality. Uh, there's some of the same sorts of issues. So this shows you the top 1% share of uh, all U.S. wealth. There's two main sources uh, of data here. Uh, Thomas Piketty uh, and colleagues uh, have uh, made a name for themselves uh, estimating the top 1% share of wealth. That's the blue line. Uh, again, it's kind of a pessimistic uh, view. They show that uh, the, the top 1% share of wealth has soared since the 1970s. The rich uh, are getting richer. Uh, the Federal Reserve also uh, estimates uh, the top 1% share of wealth. They, they do a survey every three years. Uh, which goes back to 89, and they also did some surveys back in the 1960s. So if you look at the Federal Reserve data, uh, the top 1% share of wealth uh, has been roughly flat over the last half century. It has written, risen a little bit over the, of the last decade, uh, and economists have uh, you know, debate why that might be. It probably has to do uh, with uh, technology advancement and innovation uh, and the globalization of the U.S. economy. So a lot of people in Silicon Valley are getting wealthy, uh, starting companies and becoming uh, billionaires. Uh, but, but these differences are, are really uh, dramatic. Um, so, here's, uh, so here's something to remember about, uh, about uh, both of these uh, uh, data sets. They leave out quite a bit, actually. So both of these uh, estimates of wealth, for example, leave out defined benefit pension plans, which is a big chunk of wealth for the middle class. Uh, there's been estimates, if you added in uh, the defined benefit plans, it would uh, drop these lines down by about five percentage points, uh, which is uh, a pretty big uh, uh, drop. Another issue is uh, education debt. Uh, as we all know, there's been uh, a soaring amounts of college education debt in the United States. You can see that in the Federal Reserve data. The problem is, is this is that uh, education debt has soared uh, 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 by young people who generally are less wealthy and sort of at the bottom of the wealth sort of spectrum. But what they are building with that education debt is human capital. And human capital is not in wealth data. So the debt is in the wealth data. It's making low-income folks poorer uh, on paper. But they're building human capital. And that is not included uh, in this data. Uh, one more uh, big thing that is not included, it sort of sinks in with what uh, John was talking about. Uh, this measure of, of wealth, the two main measures you often see, uh, generally don't include the U.S. welfare state, meaning uh, they don't include Social Security and Medicare and other transfer programs. The effect of Social Security and Medicare and other transfer programs is to greatly suppress uh, the amount of savings that middle uh, income and lower income people do both because uh, the existence of those programs reduces the incentive to save, but also because the government is taking away 15% of everyone's wage uh, to fund Social Security and Medicare. So there's been various estimates uh, that if you added back in sort of Social Security uh, wealth, uh, that, that the, uh, the top 1% share would drop because the middle income wealth uh, would expand substantially. So, uh, so the bottom line, from my point of view on this, is, is this, is that you know, if the 1% wealth share is a problem, there's two ways you can solve it. Uh, some uh, politicians uh, on the political left, they want to kind of knock down the top 1% with higher taxes. 
I think a better approach is to help build up uh, a bottom uh, and, and middle income folks' wealth, uh, for example, uh, with uh, personal accounts for Social Security, uh, which Cato has long advocated, which would uh, allow people to transfer uh, payroll taxes into actual, actually building uh, private uh, wealth uh, in accounts. I think I've got one more slide, and then we can open it up for questions. So the last point I want to make is that, you know, wealth in the United States is very dynamic. Uh, these charts showing 1% shares and that sort of stuff make it seem like there's a gigantic, gigantic sort of static pie and we're all fighting over shares uh, of that pie. Uh, but that is not really true. As I think Ryan uh, mentioned, in a market economy, wealth is created in a decentralized fashion, mainly by innovation. Uh, wealth in America is very dynamic. It is growing. It is not a static uh, pie. So Paul Krugman uh, said in an op-ed a few uh, months ago, quote, uh, we seem to be heading toward a society dominated by vast, often inherited fortunes, uh, unquote. Uh, that is completely false, and frankly, Mr. Krugman uh, should, should know that. Uh, since the early 1980s, Forbes magazine has been uh, collecting a, a list of the 400 richest uh, Americans. Uh, the list is very dynamic. It's got a lot of turnover. The Forbes list is a very good, a lot of, uh, is a very good uh, a quality data set. A lot of researchers use it. They do, Forbes actually does a very good job uh, measuring wealth. So if you look at the list, there's a, a couple things you find. One is just in the last 10 years, 43% of the people on the list uh, are new. Uh, there's a lot of turnover among the rank, amongst the ranks of America's billionaires. And another uh, interesting thing is a, lot of, uh, a number of scholars have looked at the list all the way back to 1982, and they sort of put people into two uh, piles, uh, folks with self-made wealth and then people with inherited wealth. Turns out the people with self-made wealth uh, have uh, greatly expanded uh, uh, on the list from 40% in uh, 1982 up to 70% in 2018. So inherited wealth is, has greatly reduced its important, uh, importance uh, in, uh, the, uh, in all of American wealth. Uh, more and more wealth is self-made. Think about Silicon Valley uh, as the best example of that. I think I'm just going to uh, wrap up uh, there. There's, there's lots of other sort of issues. Uh, I think that John and uh, Ryan touched on some of these. Um, there's the whole issue of income versus poverty. They're very different things. Uh, a lot of politicians like to conflate them. But you know, if you think about inequality, if you think about, for example, if Jeff Bezos uh, invents a, uh, a better way to deliver Amazon products, maybe he lowers the cost, maybe he speeds the delivery, uh, it may make uh, Mr. Bezos a little richer, so the top 1% share would go up, measured inequality would go up, but actually we're all better off for that if people like him uh, innovate. Uh, I think I'm going to end there. I'm happy to, uh, we're all happy to take some questions. Thanks a lot for coming. Okay, well, thank you for that, Chris and, and John. We've got about 20 minutes for questions from the floor, so i um, happy to open it out at this stage. If I can see any hands. Yes, the gentleman over there. If you could, if you could just wait for the microphone, if you could give any affiliations that you have uh, before you ask the question, that would be great. Yeah, hi, my name is Ben, uh, and I'm working for Senator Angus King's office. Uh, I just remember reading, uh, and I think that, um, I don't know if this was disputed, but the bottom 50% of households in terms of income have not seen, uh, have not seen their incomes rise alongside their, at the same pace as their growth in, in productivity. And I think that this was something that um, we observed after the end of the Second World War to the 1970s, uh, a proportional increase in income alongside productivity growth, which then uh, seemed to cease uh, after the 70s. And although productivity was rising, income for these, for this, uh, for these households would not rise at the same pace. And that, to some, is concerning for the sense of contributing to inequality and uh, just that um, people are not at the lower levels of society not getting sort of paid what they're making they're not getting they're not earning actually the extra productivity that they are providing to the companies that they work for John 
Uh, well, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what data set you know was being used there, but there are a number of them floating around that offer thoughts of that nature. But let me pick up one point you made about the lower pieces. If you look at the CBO data uh, that, that Chris uh, was referencing, uh, the top. You know, the top 1% does rise somewhat faster than the, the rest. But then if you look, the second most f rapid rise on the long term has been the lowest quintile. So, you know, this, it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not, the bottom 90%, if you would, is not uniform. There's a lot of variation within it. But then turning to the question of productivity versus the worker uh, earnings, uh, Depending on what data sets you were looking at, one of the problems is that the, when they do that, you turn the worker earnings into real dollars. Well, that real dollars has exactly the problems with the CPI that I was, was highlighting. And in fact, one of the handouts that we had there discusses that a little bit, in that when you deflate by an, an overstated CPI, the real dollars appear to be flat or going down when in fact they're going up very significantly because the CPI is overstating inflation. Now, the productivity numbers suffer a bit from that problem, but they suffer less because of the way the data are put together. I mean, I'm, that's details we probably don't want to go into right now. But uh, most data sets that, you're, that look at that show that point you're making, go, that problem goes away if you could deflate the, dollars, uh, the earnings properly by the CPI. I'll just Pro uh, sorry, Chris. throw in just a couple, a couple of points. Measuring income over time is so complex. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest, you, you, you know, uh, er, everyone, when, when you see uh, income data or, or wealth data over time, dig into what's actually in it. So, you know, a big, a, a big issue is, is that, uh, is that uh, wages may have uh, grown fairly slowly, but total compensation has grown, has, has grown faster uh, because uh, health insurance costs have soared. Uh, and so the total, if you look at total compensation, it, it has risen faster on uh, the wages. There's a whole bunch of issues with regard to family structures. Uh, the divorce rate has uh, been a lot higher at lower income levels than at top income levels. So that means that um, if you look at the top groups, they tend to be married uh, couples. You look at lower income groups, uh, there's more separate uh, single parents uh, than there used to be. So that affects uh, the data. There's all these issues with regard to if, if your starting point is income tax returns, Tax laws have changed so much over time. And just, well, just to give you one little example of this, which I read about the other day, and I, this is in the Otten and Carroll paper that I didn't know about. So the 1986 Tax Reform Act uh, made it so that a lot of people who are dependents, young people, college-age people, who used to be reported on their parents' return after 1986, were required to report separately. So there's all these millions of additional tax returns after 86 that look like they're poor folks, but in fact, they're really teenagers or college students. So, you know, economists, when you look at, when they look at this data, they should make adjustments for those sorts of changes, but often they don't. So there's a lot of complex stuff going on in the data. Yeah, one final point that I would make on your question is that um, often, and I've seen this in the context of minimum wage debates about whether the minimum wage should be raised to $15 People look at kind of aggregate productivity measures or perhaps median productivity measures, but that that incorporates very, very divergent parts of productivity in different sectors as well. Um, so if you look at sectors that you imagine might be uh, more affected by the increase in the, the minimum wage, the restaurant sector has had pretty stagnant productivity actually over the past three decades. So if you'd, if you'd um, tracked the minimum wage according to productivity in that sector, it would have remained fairly stable. Um, if you look at um, drinking establishments, productivity has actually fallen over the past three decades for a variety of reasons. So I think you have to be very, very careful about aggregating productivity across very disparate sectors. Um, next question. Yes, the gentleman there in the, in the grey shirt. Hello, thank you so much for the riveting conversation. My name is Alex, and I interned for Congressman Raul Reese. Um, so I hear you guys talking about what is considered 
poverty and like um, I believe Mr. Uh, Early mentioned like a, a different type of poverty line where you lowered it a little bit showing that poverty is actually less than uh, what the federal government is saying. Can you A, quickly speak on what those, um, what those criteria you're talking about that changes what the poverty line is? Because um, it, it just seems like and as a person who did come from a low-income family and also almost experienced amounts of homelessness, it seems that like, as opposed to addressing the actual causes of income inequality, you're simply just saying, let's lower this line so that way it seems less people are poor, essentially. Well, the first thing is you need to have your data right. Uh, and is, and 2% is better than 12%, but maybe 2% is so bad we should be doing something about it. That's, in other words, this is, we're, I'm not talking about what's good and what's bad at this point. We, that could be another conversation, but what's accurate at this point. And he, here are the reasons why the 12.3% becomes 2.2%, which is what you asked. Did you, did you want to clarify something? No, no, no. Uh, I'd like to follow up if you don't mind, if we have time. Okay. But um, the first thing is we need to count all the income. The calculation of the poverty level does not count all the people's income by a factor you know, of about four. You know, so the, it's undercounted. So that was the first adjustment. The second adjustment has to do with the consumer price index, which is fairly technical, uh, but there's a vast literature uh, over the last 50 years, in fact, showing that, that the CPI overstates impl uh, inflation by a rate of between one and a half and 0.8 percent per year. Uh, improvements in the index have been getting it down closer to 0.8% per year. But that means then that a s almost, we've almost double the standard of living associated with saying that this is the poverty line. Now we can declare that we think it ought to go up, but we ought to measure it consistently and then say, okay, we think as a matter of policy, we're gonna double the level that we call, po uh, call poverty. Well, that, that's the policy decision that can be made, but let's just, grant that that's what we're doing rather than sneaking it in under the CPI. Okay, other questions? So yeah, we'll take the, the blonde lady there and then the, the gentleman, uh, a few, couple of rows in front. Hey, my name is Victoria. I'm with Senator David Perdue. Um, I was wondering when you changed the poverty threshold, I'm assuming it originally used CPIW and you changed it to CPIU. Um, why did... Why did you not use chain CPIU? It was my question. No, okay, well, there, yeah, there's several good reasons for that. Uh, one is, of course, this, what's called CPIW uh, doesn't technically exist before, well, it depends on how you d define it. Technically, CPIW goes all the way back to 1918. Then CPIU was introduced in 1960, something, I forget the exact number, but you know, about that time, the late 60s. And that was by, we have, now have two indexes that are just weighted slightly differently. And the, and the CPIU was then selected to be, from that split, was selected by OMB. And so that's just the one that OMB uses. So I'm just, re I'm repeating the OMB process. Okay. Yes, so and the reason for not using the chain index because uh, is the, the chain index only goes back to the 1980s, 1988 or something like that. It doesn't go back any farther than that. So, so we, we, what we used as the, uh, as the ideal index is we use the PCIP, PCEPI, the uh, Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, and then subtracted further from that because it also suffers from about a half a percent per year in um, misstated uh, quality adjustments. Thanks so much for being here. It was a great uh, presentation. My name is Christian. I'm with Congressman Chip Roy from Texas. Um, unfortunately, and generally, the left likes to divide people amongst skin color and races. Um, they like to do this principally with econom economics and uh, wealth. Um, so I was wondering if you could, uh, Mr. Edwards, if you've looked at um, if you've looked at uh, wealth accumulation amongst races and ethnicities, and if you've seen an improvement uh, against uh, minorities. Uh, Actually, so the place to go for that is, so every three years the Federal Reserve Board does the Survey of Consumer Finances. If you just Google that, you'll find it. So the most recent one shows uh, changes between 2013 and 2016. 
Um, and what it actually does show is that uh, lower income folks and minorities, they break it down by race, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, increased uh, wealth and income pretty substantially. They are at much lower levels uh, than whites, uh, but there is a very heartening uh, increase at the bottom end. So that's between 2013 and 2016. I think the three years before that uh, didn't look so good. Um, but the last, the most recent three years that, they, that the Federal Reserve Board uh, looked at, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, substantial increases. Okay, you've got time for a couple more questions. So the lady here in the stripes top. Sure. So with this data, how do you relate it back to, you know, some of the policy issues that we see that have been increasing? And I come from the um, City Council Office of Councilman DeCicio in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so as it relates to homelessness, for example, homelessness has been in the media as far as those rates skyrocketing and issues with affordable housing. How, how do you think that the numbers that you just saw, um, that you just presented, relate back to those policy issues? I mean, I would just uh, add a comment on uh, about your last bit. Housing affordability is a huge it's a huge problem, especially on uh, the two coasts. Uh, Cato's put out some studies on on that issue. Um, the uh, there is a reason why uh, housing prices are soaring. Uh, it's because a lot of governments in a lot of states, particularly on the coasts, the coast uh, restrict supply of building of new housing. And this is a widely uh, understood problem. I think both Democrats and Republicans get that problem. But it's mainly a state local problem. Um, so uh, that's where I would, you know, housing is the largest expense uh, for people with moderate incomes. Uh, I think that that would, should be the starting point, I think, to address some of those issues mentioned. Yeah, actually, on, on this very point, I mean, it's a different way of thinking about um, poverty, I think, from the question you related. Um, here we've talked a lot about income and sources of income and often policymakers in, inherently reach for what I'd describe as income-based um, solutions to poverty, whether that be increase in minimum wage rates or, or indeed more in the way of government transfers. But I think it would be more useful to look at it from the other end of the telescope and say there are certain essential goods and services that, that everybody needs to, to live a decent life and what are the potential problems in the markets for housing and childcare and energy and transport and a number of other things, why are, are these often very expensive and what can we do about it? And that is work that Cato has done a lot on. I had a paper published last year that showed on quite cautious assumptions that across a range of areas on, on those policy issues, um, for typical poor families, government policies raised the cost of living by anywhere between eight hundred and three and a half thousand dollars a year. So, if, if you'd like to take a look at that, it's on Cato's website. So, we've got time for I think one more question. Uh, yes, lady here. Hi, I'm Isabella. I'm from Senator Udall's office, and um, well, I had a question about the Gini coefficient chart with all the different countries and kind of the the way that it's compared now and the way that you've looked at the numbers more deeply and seen how the United States actually ranks more similarly to all these other countries. I wanted to know if um, those other countries might also have kind of a some hidden money, a, a better way at looking at them um, that might rank them also s differently, maybe a deeper look um, in where the money is, because I feel like it's generally known that the United States is one of the most conservative, um, like ideologically, politically, less taxes than a lot of other first world countries. So I found that kind of surprising. Okay, it's a good question, uh, because obviously if we change one piece, should we be changing some of the others? Um, but in order to try to deal with that, there is some level of uh, documentation that each of the countries presents with what they put in. So I went back and I read that. Uh, and the French in particular have very detailed documentation. Uh, and as best I can tell, the things that we left out are things that they would have included, or at least in some cases. In some cases, they're documentation is a little thin, and I can't be sure, but in the case of the French, I think everything we've put in, by their definitions, we, they would have put it in too, but we didn't. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's part of it. But another is this notion about taxes. 
um, there's, there's a, an important fact difference between two types of taxes. There are income-related taxes, which is proper income tax, payroll tax. Um, the other is then the taxes on goods and services. Those are only in sales taxes, state and local in the US, and, and a few excise taxes. Uh, but in Europe, where these, uh, and most of those other countries there have sufficient value-added taxes. And those are paid by everybody. Whereas the income taxes are proportionate more or less to your income. And in fact, if it's a, gra if it's a, uh, you know, a progressive tax like ours is, you, know, you pay more as it, as it goes up. But the others are more or less proportional to how much you spend. Um, and one of, the, one of the important differences is in the, in the US, the top 30%, I mean, sorry, the top 10%, the top 10% of American taxpayers pay 33.5% of their income in taxes. And the, um, the, other, uh, the others uh, pay, or uh, the remaining uh, pay only, I'm sorry, they pay 33.5% of the, of, the, of the taxes, and they, they pay 45, but they, and they have 45% of the, 45% um, of the tax and 35% of the income. I, I keep getting myself turned around, okay. So they have 30% of the, of the income, 45% of the taxes, which means, and that ratio is one to 1.35. So they, they, proportionally, they're, they're taxed 35% more. This is on income taxes. In France, instead of 35% more, it's just 10% more. And in Germany, it's just 7% more, okay? So in fact, our income taxes are far more progressive than the typical large, uh, industrial economy. The difference is they pay a whole lot more taxes because they have that big VAT tax, and that's paid by everybody. In fact, a, a fellow was here from Norway who, who was speaking, and he said, you know, we, had to, we found out we raised our, the income tax on the high guys, and it turned out, what did they do? They moved away. So we had to reduce it, and, it, and people don't usually realize that that happened. You know, they, they didn't reduce it, and they say, so how did we get all this money for our welfare state? We tax the poor because you're paying the VAT. So you have to, you know, th there's more tax in Europe and in, and in some of these other countries, but that tax is disproportionately VAT taxes. And if you look at income-driven taxes, ours are actually the most progressive of any of the major uh, economies. That's OECD data too, and I'll be glad to show you where it is if you want. Well, thank you very much. Um, Everyone, I, I hope you enjoyed that. If you could thank uh, our two speakers, John Early and Chris Edwards, in the usual way. Thank you.